experience similar to what Moody talked about in his book, Life After Life. So Sarah and I said, well, maybe we ought to look into this further. We devised a scientific protocol to interview these people. We tape recorded the interviews. We took down their background data, their demographics, et cetera. And this went on for five years. First of all, I'd get permission to tape record it and then say, okay, go. Tell me what happened. Two or three people lifted me and put me up on a dolly all all metal, four legged metal. When they first threw me up on the table, he struck me. And I mean he really wiped the hell out. They shoved a plastic tube like that you put in an oil can. They shoved that in my mouth. And at that point I noticed another table wipe arrangement with a bunch of stuff on it. I know it later the machine that they can thump you with. They were coming toward their room on me. That's what it was. When you were up looking down on your butt, did you see detail? Uh, yeah, I see a whole lot of detail, like blood spot on the wall. The splatter on the wall, and then they had walked it up. These people say, I've never told anybody about this, Doc, and by the way, I'm the only one that's ever had this. So the near-death experience at that time, and that's about 45 years ago, was not well known. And so these people were sort of coming up with it on their own, and they were suspicious of me asking the questions, which to me lent credibility to what they were telling me. Many of them said, for example, that they had tried to tell their doctor about it or a minister about it and that they were dismissed. And in those initial years, I, the people that I uh, talked with were just very happy that at last somebody would listen to them. I started at Northern Kentucky University in 1972. I was hired as an assistant professor and I was uh, offered a promotion to full professor at the age of 25, and I was also given tenure my um, third year. Seven students, myself and my wife, toured Amsterdam and then went up to Denmark, spent a few days there, went to Sweden for a day, and last week, it was a three-week trip, and our last week was a week in uh, Paris. It was an art tour, and it was um, pretty much all museums. On that Saturday morning, June 1st, 1985, I had the most acute pain I'd ever experienced in my life in the center of my abdomen, right there. It was terrifying because it, never, it, it just came from nowhere and I never experienced such acute pain. I mean, this is like the kind of pain that blows the top of your head off. The doctor came very quickly, got me up off the floor with a great deal of difficulty because I couldn't move. He knew exactly what was wrong and told me that I had a perforation of the duodenum, which means I had a hole go through my small stomach. What was happening was the hydrochloric acid and the enzymes and the bacteria and everything are now migrating, leaking into my abdominal cavity. To put it in crude terms, I was um, digesting myself on the inside. Without exaggeration, what it felt like was fire. My wife riding alongside of me in the vacuum as we traveled 70, 80 miles an hour through the streets of Paris to the big city hospital. They confirmed basically if I didn't have the surgery in an hour, I would die. So they sent me to the surgical hospital and because it was the weekend, there was no doctor available, no surgeon available at the hospital they sent me to. So I was put in a room. I begged, I screamed, I yelled. And my wife begged and yelled and screamed. Sorry, we need a doctor to prescribe something. I 
hours for 10 hours. About once an hour, the nurse would come in and ask how I was doing, and I would tell her in French and in English that I was dying, and uh, shrug their shoulders and walk away. I wasn't in fear, I was in terror, because um, I was 38 years old, very successful in my career at the university, you know, wife and two kids, nice house, two cars, the thing that kept going through my mind is this can't be happening, this can't be happening, this can't be happening. People ask me, how do you know you were dying? It's like the stupidest question in the world. When you're dying, you know it. With every breath. I felt like I had one more breath to go. The nurse came into the room at 8.30 that night and said they were sorry, but they were unable to locate a doctor and they would try to find one the next day, which was Sunday. Well, when she said that, I was like, okay, it's over, it's done. You know, I can't do this anymore. You know, I'm, I'm exhausted. And I looked at her and it was um, horrible to see her crying like that. And uh, I closed my eyes and just started trying to breathe. Then I went unconscious. I was an atheist and I knew that when you die, it's just over. It's like the big nothing, you know, void, the end. The official impact speed recorded by the National Transportation Safety Board was 135 miles an hour. We impacted right below the cockpit. With that impact speed, it just exploded the cockpit into, it, we just, everything was opened up. We hit that dome and fell, boom, right down to the ground. I'm told by the curator of the mausoleum that the mausoleum is six stories, seven stories tall, and we slammed right into the top of it. I can remember today as well as I could five years ago, 10 years ago. You realize that you are not a body. I believe it's what happens to everyone when they die. I awoke from unconsciousness, standing there next to the bed, feeling better than I'd ever felt before in my life. My vision was greatly increased. Instead of seeing 106 degrees, I could see almost 360 degrees. My depth of field was total. When I looked at something close, I, everything far was in focus. Being an artist and being a visual person, that was the first thing. It was like, wow. I've never been able to see like this. Then I realized that I could hear, smell, taste, touch, everything. I could feel all the little nuances in the cold linoleum floor. I could hear the buzzing of the fluorescent lights in the ceiling really loudly. All of my senses were greatly, greatly enhanced. I'm looking down and I'm realizing there's my body, but I'm up here. I can't be dead because I've never felt more alive. I was not only alive, I was free. And I didn't understand this, but I realized then, okay, I am a spirit. I have a soul. And I used to live in that body. I was pressed up against the instrument panel and was motionless. It was 16 minutes before the fire department got there. The paramedics got there right after. They put me and Chuck in the same ambulance and I have tremendous strong memories that I'm watching my body and Chuck and I'm chasing that ambulance as it goes through the streets. I have no idea how to explain a lot of the things we're talking about, but chasing that ambulance without really any effort, how did I do that? I don't know. I wasn't worried. I wasn't in pain. I wasn't concerned, it really. I was questioning, what is this all about?
Now, while no two near-death experiences are the same, they have a very consistent pattern.